Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And good afternoon to everyone who is joining us online on the Zoom link. My name is Gabby Lamini, and I'll be your facilitator today. Welcome back to our Author Fridays. Today's book launch and roundtable is a very special one indeed. Written by Umam Luisa Zondo, Dearest Mariki is a mother's journey through grief, trauma, and healing. The book launch and roundtable are hosted by the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education in collaboration with the Center for Women and Gender Studies. Please allow me to introduce Prof. Andrea Kitt, our DVC of Engagement and Transformation, as well as the Chair for Krishit, who will do our opening and welcoming for us. Thank you so much. <clears throat> our deepest sympathies are extended to a family and loved ones and our George campus community. We are struggling, in a sense, reeling, temporarily crushed and broken, and we need to find another life in all of this and regenerate our agencies. We also need to make time for working this trauma and institutional grief and think and do renewed ways of taking the battle forward. The book we are discussing today, amongst other themes, engage with the matter of gender-based violence. So despite our somber moment, it is my absolute pleasure and honor to welcome you to this launch of Dearest Mariki, Mother's Journey Through Grief, Trauma and Healing, a book by Louisa Zondo. I feel personally grateful to our outfits who are co-hosting this event Louisa was my boss when I started working at the Human Rights Commission in the mid-1990s, an experience that had a lasting impact on my life. So please welcome Louisa Zondo. Her book for which I wrote a review is not an easy one to read as it deals with loss, violence, mental health struggles. At the same time, as the title of the book reveals, it is a story of critical hope where difficult emotions can be transfigured into productive alternatives through healing work. This is also a deeply personal book that, to use that feminist adage, it is necessarily political and public. It is a book that deals with the loss of a son, Ricardo, who is also famous South African rap star, songwriter, and singer. And all this is entangled in a broader concern with societal challenges. As I put in the review, yearning for new ways to, of life to grow from the decomposing human systems that produced our wicked world, Louisa connects her personal struggles and trauma to the stuckness of humanity, having to live with renewed vitality as a commitment to her life writing and to Ricardo is entangled with the desperate need for a different politics, for new ways of being and doing. She strains forward towards a politics of planetary thinking and action. So Louisa, a very warm welcome to Mandela University. Uh, we are looking forward to engaging with your story and what it offers us in terms of thinking through new possibilities. A warm welcome too to Louisa's life partner, Minaidu, and their son, Tobacco Gladla, from a social media and photography team who is supporting her in sharing the book with South African readers and beyond. Please give them a warm welcome, round of applause. <laughs> and then to our two respondents, Dr. Sianda Majombozi, who has traveled from Pretoria uh, to be with us today, and Prof. Yassin Ali, our own Department of Psychology, Thank you so much, Yanda and Yasin. A warm welcome to them as well. And then, of course, welcome to our friends and colleagues from the Center for Women and Gender Studies, with whom we are hosting, hosting this event today, and with much appreciation for their co-traveling with us in so many ways over the years. I also see some colleagues here who have been walking this journey with us. So many, many thanks for being here. Welcome to those who are attending online from both inside and outside of our university. And welcome to all of you who are attending in person today. It's always heartwarming 
to see the support from students and staff from across the faculties and intellectually stimulating to engage with the university community. Our Vice Chancellor, I'm sure, will also join us. So in her absence for now, welcome to her as well. So we look forward to the discussion today as we grapple with the deeply effective nature of Louisa's story. Welcome everyone and please enjoy the session. Thank you, Prof. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Umam Louisa Zondo to um, come up. I'll just read um, her bio quickly. A mother of much loved music star Ricky Rick, who tragically took his own life in 2022, Louisa Zondo's loss was shared by millions, but it was also uniquely deep, lonely, life shattering grief. The loss of her beloved Mariki also brought to the surface cataclysmic trauma from her past. She is a lawyer and political activist who has held numerous high profile roles in public life. She served as Deputy Executive Director of the Constitutional Assembly during South Africa's transition from apartheid going on to becoming Chief Executive of the South African Human Rights Commission in 1996. She has subsequently held a number of senior roles in public and non-profit sector organizations, most recently as Acting Executive Director of Oxfam South Africa. Along with other members of her family, Louisa is currently involved in establishing the Ricky Rick Foundation for the promotion of activism in memory of her son, Ricardo Macado, who died in February 2022. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I have to start somewhere, so um, I want to start off by just giving an overview of the book. I wrote the, the book in response to a yearning that had been building up over a long long, long time. It was a yearning to be able to tell the story of what it was for me to be living life. And it remained a yearning because the book or the books that wanted to be written were just not coming out. And I continued to live life um, in a way that really was filled with trouble. I was a mother raising children in an environment where I was torn between what I'm called to do as a broader service and what my deep love for my children may be guiding me to be with them. And that was one of the huge paradoxes of my life. When my children grew up, it was obvious that there was trouble in the area of parenting. It was obvious that my ways of being as a human being, but particularly as a parent to them, were not helpful. I had learned from life to try and make everything look okay. I had, try, I had learned from life to give of myself even in ways that truly and completely depleted me in an attempt to gain value, in an attempt to gain opening in those spaces of love, especially love for the person that I looked up to dearly, my father. So this is a book that tells you that a pattern that had um, developed in me impacted my children, my parenting, 
impacted my drive to do well, excel, participate in spheres that were really important, that needed participation, but for me, there was an additional thing about my own value and how the doing in those spaces was supposed to contribute to my value. When my children then confronted the troubles in their lives, I was not quite equipped to open up and to engage them so that we have real conversations about what is happening in life. I loved them dearly and I continue to love them dearly. But the drive to bring things to a point where they appear to be okay, they appear to be acceptable according to certain standards that I had come to buy into was greater than the risk of sitting down and suddenly realizing that all things fall apart here. Yeah. But they were going to fall apart and they started fall apart, falling apart when it was no longer possible to hide from the fact that my beloved son was unable to cope with addiction to drugs. And they did fall apart in that instance. And that did become some opportunity to go into some truth. But very soon thereafter, it appeared that space was again opened for normal life to continue and the comfortable space continued. Ricardo, Ricardo was open and publicly spoke about the tragedy of mental health not being a center of our attention as human beings. He was open about how relationships contributed to the crushing of our sense of well-being, of our ability to locate ourselves in healthy ways in society and find ourselves valuable and value our relationships. For him, those questions of how, how, how could my parents not be here completely for me, fully for me? How could my father even die at the moment when I thought that I'd finished boarding school and I now was going to have a relationship with him and going to land at his feet. How could he die at that moment? There's a question which comes up in the book which he may not have shared in public. And his question to his wife when he's really suffering some period of, of deep depression and darkness, he asks his wife the question, but why would my mother have spent all those days when she comes back from work locked up in her room and having no space for me? Why did my mother not want me? And when I learned that, I approached him and said, what I'm going to try and do is to tell you the story of my life and I'm going to write letters to you. I'm going to try and give you some insight into what shaped me, what shapes me, how I see things, and I'm, trying, I'm going to try and do it in letters. I promise you, I did try. I sat and I tried to write. I was writing letters to Mariki at that time. I went back to B, Bianca, his wife, I said, Bianca, I've been trying, but the story just doesn't come out. My life just doesn't come out. I'm unable to speak my life to myself. I'm unable to speak my life to my son. When he 
when he then dies on the 23rd of February from suicide, um, everything just gets shattered. Uh, I walk, I continue doing things that I was doing in life, but everything in me is shattered. Everything is just not together. It's in pieces. I did start writing some letters to him, though, and that was from the 24th of March, when I was walking up Mount Everest to base camp, and I had a huge sense at that time that I'm walking with his spirit, that I'm walking with him, that I am in his presence, and that I'm going to relate to him, I'm going to speak to him. So while I was walking out up the mountain, I was posting um, these conversations uh, that were short conversations, but they were conversations with Ricardo. That then led to the writing of this book, which I thought was going to be quite um, easy, well, not really easy, but I thought was already a possibility that's readily available to me because I'd been writing those posts and people were responding to them, people were feeling they were useful, and I was feeling that I was being of service. And in addition, some people were nice enough to tell me that I write well, and I thought, wow, that's it. I, I will be able to write the book. But the book didn't come out until I went through deep, deep, deep therapy and I took the whole of my life and I was looking at the whole of my life because that process of being in therapy and I was in therapy for about six months before I was able to start writing but that process helped me to encounter the Louisa that had been on earth for 58 years, for more than 58 years at that time, and had never been given the opportunity to really, really look at that life, look at the sadness, look at the anger, look at the wishes, the real aspirations, look at the disappointments, and look at the traumas, the pain, the violence, the damage, that that life had experienced and start telling a story about that life, which is a story which does not come from what has been done, but comes from the glimpse of who the true being is in here. Comes from the building of empathy for that little one who lived in fear. Fear aggravated by so many rules. And, and that shaped her. So developing that empathy for that one, developing empathy for my relationships, my loved one, Kumi over there, my children, the family, developing empathy for other people in whatever place I encounter them, learning to develop empathy for circumstances. And you'll see in the book, there are some circumstances. It's not as if this is a life that is unique. Many reading the book will find that this is a life that sounds like their own lives. But there are instances there of real violence, of gender-based violence, of 
rape by multiple people who invade our own home. And so when this surfaces in my life and I begin to understand how I must learn to bring up softness to myself in order to be able to lend softness to the next person whose circumstances I will not know. And the best I could do for them is to offer the ability to understand that you are a human being, you are going through things and let it be softness that you get from me. Such that even for those people who were involved in that home invasion, it becomes possible to let go of any form of hatred, but to focus on what humanity would have done to make it possible for us as human beings to stab somebody else at George campus to death. To allow those questions to trouble us so deeply that we turn the telescope onto ourselves in every space that we are in and say, what is my contribution to this system which dehumanizes, which separates us, which makes us so greedy that we clamor for personal comforts and possession and stature and name and position in our academic institutions. And we forget about what's happening to the collective because we are all connected. It's that inability to find the love for ourselves, probably, that leads us to be unable to see that resources for the country are not resources for my family, and therefore I should not be stealing them. And so this book is based on lessons from Ricardo, because Ricky Rick, in a very energizing way, called on us to care for each other, called on us to love each other, called on us to apply that to every part of our lives and therefore be pathways, each one of us to be the pathway to good. I don't know how much time has been allocated um, for me to speak. And if I do get an indication, I'll use the last uh, moments to breach some confidentiality. Oh, I see a nod there. I think it's just the last part which gave that enthusiastic <laughs> nod. <laughs> I can go ahead. So, so, in the writing of the book, I remembered that I had taken steps. You remember I started off by, by saying that for years and years I'd been yearning to, to, to put my story out, to put my story in writing. Then I remembered an encounter, which was for me a step towards that. So I am going to breach a little bit of confidentiality with Prof. Kit here. Because I write in the book that I have been struggling for many years with writing and sharing the stories of my life. For as many years as I have struggled with writing, 
I've also imagined that if I allowed myself to give some coherence to the stories in my life and to share them, this might guide me towards making sense of life and might even heal the parts of life that feel so desperately disconnected. So in November 2021, this I don't write in the book, but in November 2021, I took a step towards addressing my struggle with telling my story. I was at the Chief David Stierman in International Airport waiting for my flight to Joburg when I, I saw Prof. Andre Kidd rushing to board his flight. I acted on the decision which came to me like a flash. I asked an Oxfam South Africa colleague that I was traveling with to take care of my bags and I rushed over to speak to Andre. What I asked him is captured in the email communi communication which I sent to him five days thereafter. Of course, without his permission, I now breach confidentiality. So on Wednesday, the 17th of November at 1.47, an email with the subject which reads, please help, I need hands to hold me, hover over me and all read as follows. I have decided to just put the words down. The reason for the delayed email from last Friday when I met you at the airport till now is that is at the core of the challenge I am throwing your way right now. I need a place, a space, a teacher, teachers, guides, and all sorts of support and illumining to rescue me from what feels like a perpetual labyrinth. For a very long time, even from my early childhood really, I have had a deep sense in me that purpose for me is to make it better, to help us heal our histories, our stories. I have this vivid memory of a conversation I had while I was doing the LLM at the London School of Economics in 1989-1990. I was telling a friend, Rauf Mazu, who lived in Switzerland that, sorry, who lived in Switzerland and had roots in the Congo and Niger, that I dream of my children going to university and finding books on the shelves of their own reference libraries that are authored as much by black South Africans as perhaps white. He probed further, asking something akin to, what would that have to do with you? My response included a pronouncement that at least 10 of those titles will bear my name. I can tell you now, I was not talking about a cosmic my name. I actually was expressing a dream which sent tingles and tightening, warm and freezing sensations throughout my body, even as I expressed it in that conversation. Some 31 years later, I am still grappling and taking the time and making the space to immerse myself in the deepening of inquiry and articulation of matters relating to love and justice, the issues of being, the freedom associated with understanding our stories and histories as individuals, communities, countries, nations, etc., and working through them for the healing of our violence, hatred, greed, disconnect, and dysfunction. A lot is battling to emerge from the 57 years I have lived, it was then, from trying to navigate deep, deep contradictions and paradoxes I encounter in the family that I was raised in, teenage motherhood, and marriage, 
organizing for a post-apartheid South Africa, leadership roles in the face of, the, of ANC edification and discontents, drug addiction and dysfunction in adult children as they battle to heal from the, from the childhood I was instrumental in shaping for them, to wondering about what opportunities we have to reverse the erasure of women and young people and regenerative and sorry and regenerate their full potential to address challenges of South Africa, which are inextricably linked to the challenges of the world and a lot in between. With these few words, I'm burdening you for conversations, conversations which will give me a leg up into taking the change steps. There are still 10 books at the very least that must be written. They are a pathway for my personal healing. I felt I needed to read this to you in this context because a few months thereafter, this I wrote in November, and we did have conversations with Andre. We started planning uh, some work, but this was briefly um, brought to, this was swiftly brought to a, a stop by Ricardo's passing on the 23rd of February. But what I want to share with you is the reali reality that we never can do it alone. For me, this was a step that I, I should have and could have taken many, many, many years back. But at that moment, in that airport, I took the step and I said, help me. I'm going to die if I don't write. I'm going to die if I don't share these stories. So may it be that for each and every one of us, we may find a place that we can cast our gaze at and say, help me, hold me up. This is what is killing me inside. I need to change that story and make it a story of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Wow, what an incredible, incredible, incredible story. In your book at the beginning, you say, now that I've written my story, I hope that, inspi that it inspires me to live up to my commitment to encounter all people with compassion in all circumstance. I continue to receive immeasurable compassion and loving kindness from family and friends, even though over the years they suffered from my trauma-based irrational decisions. This heightens my awareness of the reality that I do not know what others are dealing with, and therefore my best contribution to them must be to treat everyone with compassion all the time. My story teaches me that we are all doing the best we can with the capacities we have, and therefore, even as we mess up in life, as I did and as we all do, we all deserve compassion. This compassion may give space to someone who, co who caught up in a rage that may be associated with an unresolved tra trauma to navigate out of their flooding of emotion and perhaps address the root and cause of their anger. The experience of being stuck in a story, struggling to find ways of letting it go and seizing an opportunity for a new one to take root, enriched, the key lessons from, enriched by key lessons from the past, seems to be the tale of the universe. Humanity is stuck in the stories of decayed political, economic and social, cultural and environmental systems which perpetuate the violence and unsustainability of coloniality, misogynism, racism and greed. It seems the framework proposed as alternatives to the decayed systems replicate the violence and unsustainability and therefore do not contribute to the dismantling of oppression. <sighs> Thank you very much. I will be introducing our respondents. Our two respondents today are Prof. Yasin Ali and Dr. Ziyanda Majombozi. Uh, before I introduce them, I would like to apologize for the noise that we had earlier. I'm grateful and thankful that it has ended. <laughs> 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 
Prof. Yasin Ali is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Nelson Mandela University. He is registered with the Health Professionals Council of South Africa. As a research psychologist and registered counselor, Yasin's research intersects are twofold. Firstly, he's passionate about indigenous knowledge systems and mental health, as well as the field of gender and identity with specific reference to cultural constructions of masculine and feminine ideals. He has published books, chapters, and journal articles and presented his work at conferences both nationally and globally. He is currently the lead examiner for the National Examination for Research Psychology and has been co-opted onto the Education Training and Research Committee for the Professional Board of Psychology. And our second respondent, Dr. Zianda Majombozi, is a lecturer in social anthropology at the University of Pretoria and has done research on a wide range of topics such as infant feeding, care practices of working class black mothers, care practices of mothers affected by tuberculosis, as well as research on teaching and learning. Her current research focuses on contemporary ideas about birthing practices and, some social, reproduction, and social reproduction among middle class black women in Johannesburg. Her broader research interests include reproductive, maternal and child health, childbearing, family care, motherhood, and politics of reproduction. Hello. <laughs> you can go sit at the top and you can all. Um, yeah. Both of you. Whilst they're taking their seats, you're also reminded that the book is uh, available outside um, with Fogarty's bookshop. It is uh, 240 rand. And thank you very much. And to our online audience, please do post your questions as our respondents are, are talking on stage, and we will um, address them soon after. Sorry, uh, Professor, you can start with us, please. Okay, and good afternoon. I trust that everyone's well, and with what Ma Luisa actually just shared, I think that the, the mood in the room is quite somber, right? And rightfully so, because what we are discussing is not something that should elicit happiness in us, but it should trouble us with more questions. And <clears throat> I, I've got my notes, obviously. I've, I went through the book. My Louise, I have to thank you, actually, for putting these words down. It's something that I've been very passionate about in psychology, and I've written about this for some time. The fact that as students of psychology, we are very astute in reflecting on the need to become a psychologist. Okay? You know what I'm talking about if you were a psychology student here. But the moment these practitioners become these masters of human behavior, there's a twisting that takes place in the narrative. And instead of a focus on the humanity and the ethical practice of trying to understand and heal others, you assume a position of narcissism, of histrionic ownership over psychological knowledge and well-being. And I speak now as a professor in psychology who's been training students for years. And I see this year in and year out. We get students coming in, wanting to change the world. And the moment they start earning, things shift. It's no longer about healing, but about my pocket. And I'm going to get into a lot of trouble about this, but I think it's about time that we trouble mental health in South Africa as well. And we challenge the current status quo of how we understand how mental health is currently expressed, the training, and the limitations that are posed by this current system. So I thank you for putting into words what most textbooks in psychology cannot capture. <laughs> And this has been my biggest angst um, and frustration with the field of psychology, that we tend to latch ourselves onto theories and ideas and epistemological positionings that are very Western and colonially entrenched and have whiteness as a hegemonic discourse that's embedded within them. And we take these theories that are Eurocentrically implied and then we apply them to all people of South Africa without much criticism, without much reflection, without actually engaging with ourselves as owners and masters and specialists of human behavior. 
our focus as therapists have actually become to analyze the other. Because I'm the expert, right? And you are pathologized. It's making sense. I mean, my psychology M2 students are there. They know exactly what I'm talking about. When you embody this role of becoming an expert, suddenly you fail to realize that you have human emotions yourself, that you have pathologies yourself, that you are struggling, that you've got pain, you've got hurt, you've got sadness. Because why? You're now an expert at human behavior. And my pain and my story means nothing because I'm focused on only you and curing you. And my frustration with this is that we fail to actually capture the lived realities, the autoethnographic stories of practitioners, of their lives, of the instances of, of pain and hurt that they've gone through, that they are then able to reflect quite critically through theory. Because you are master of human behavior, right? You know the theories, you know what's going on. But have you ever reflected deeply on what the theory means in your own life? And how do you then take your lived reality, intersect it with that theory, and actually build something that is relevant for the communities and the people of South Africa? And it's a frustration, right? Because before I actually get to the question I have, um, I have to say these things because it builds the context and the framework. If you look at the world or South Africa pre-COVID, South Africa has a host of psychosocial issues and conflicts and experiences that have placed us in a position of constant denial and defense from colonial oppression, apartheid, violence, crime, rape. South Africa is in a problem. We are problematized, right? And then COVID hits. And, and we go through these grieving processes, trauma. And post-COVID, we are informed that mental health is a pandemic, an endemic, there's a problem. And yet the training of mental health practitioners remains the same, adopting an archaic approach of only training seven students every single year per program. If you look at the register of psychologists in the country, I can assure you we are less than 30,000 registered professionals. In a country of more than 56 point something million people, I think my number is even off, I think we're going to 58 something million. How many people is one, a, a psychologist in terms of the stats? It's like one psychologist to what? A couple of hundred thousand? But here's the critical question then, where do these psychologists actually go and practice? Where do they practice? And what does that then mean for what psychology is actually doing? Is that we're not actually addressing the mental health needs of the country, but of a select few who are able to afford the facilities. Okay, now I'm, I'm giving you that context. That's my thoughts, my ideas, my disenfranchisement with psychology at the moment, because I question what exactly are we doing? What exactly are psychologists doing? What are we advocating for? And if we are advocating for anything, we're actually losing the battle. And we need to change their approach drastically. Um, Maluisa, you actually, the end of your book was the beginning of my existential and epistemological crisis. And I'm not gonna leave the audience here in mystery. You need to be a part of this crisis with me. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm just gonna take a moment to take a sip of water, um, if that's okay. Okay, so it's the very last paragraph of the book, and I'm, I'm just going to read this very quickly. While I'm deeply grateful that three and a half months after Ricardo's death, Kumi and I went into therapy and have remained in therapy, I am troubled that many are unable to access even basic support to hold them through the dark journey that the soul takes when a loved one has died by suicide. The suicide rate in South Africa has reached epidemic proportions, with 23.5 of every 100,000 people taking their own lives. With the suicide, rank, suicide rate ranking ninth in the world and third on the African continent, there is every reason for mental health and well-being to be placed at the center of all our endeavors. And this is now the crux of the entire book for me. 
It's a question that is posed, and I guess we, we are going to have to be troubled by this question for a very long time. What would it take for the government, private sector, the non-profit sector, and civil society to reimagine a country in which mental health services and the well-being of all is catered for? It's a seemingly simple question, but it is fraught with much complexity. And I don't know if we have the answer to that as yet. So I guess that's the first question I'd like to raise based on writing the book. Where do you see this actually going in terms of advocacy? Because the current means or the way in which we are advocating is obviously failing. And psychologists themselves need to be educated on how to do mental health because we've become so self-absorbed in the one-on-one -on -one business of, of providing healing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that, Prof. Ali. Um, and I think you pose the question and you correctly say the answer is to be worked on. And yet you also say something profound which must help us go towards the answers which is the way we are communicating it, the way we are going at it, the way we are educating about it is currently not working. And so that is possibly a very, very rich space to start um, as, we answer, as we try to co-create the appropriate meaningful answers to this. I am so glad you've reaffirmed the idea that the DSM is not our health. Thank you. So I, I think it does start there where we are looking at what we have been doing and how we've been doing and seeking to be different. How about we start looking at what moves us, what gives us vitality, and start there to say, how, how does this contribute to our well-being and our, our mental well-being? Well and how can we start operating from here in every space that we are involved in to show up our mental health? to show up our well-being, to convert ourselves into a humanity that connects and sees joy in each other and sees joy in connecting and sees joy in being alive because we have tapped on those things that give us vitality. How about we look to broadening our understanding of what arts and culture is? And we find ourselves bringing the, that into those very serious lecture rooms that are trying to understand the mind. Not even sure if we know what the definition of the mind is. So, so, so I am saying these times are the times that present powerful, exciting opportunity for us to take the freedom, to give ourselves permission to start anew and not be guided by what we know because it's not worked. We can learn from it and we can know what is useful from what does not work and we can apply it in a new way, devoid of the hostilities, the violence of the systems that we are steeped in right now. All of them. Can we, can we start understanding the violence in the systems we are in and start bringing in our artfulness in it and start allowing our vitality to, to shift us? 
that's all I can say to the question. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. I, I think that's a very pertinent point is to what, what you're hinting at and what you're alluding to is looking within, you know, stepping away from the external, looking within, connecting with yourself and attempting to reconnect with others. It's the basis of Ubuntu, essentially, right? A step away from a colonial perspective and looking outside of yourself and connecting truthfully with those around you. There's a point I want to raise. I said that pre-COVID, South Africans were in, in, a, in a traumatized state as, as a country. Collectively, we are. And post-COVID as well, and this is reflected in how we use uh, certain defense mechanisms of humor. If anything traumatic and tragic is happening to us as a nation from loss of electricity to whatever it is, look at the comments that South Africans are posting and the things we are doing. That is a reflection of us actually introjecting or, or, or reacting formations, you know, where we, we're turning what we actually think into something humorous because we have not been equipped with how to deal with sadness, with pain, with those emotions that are not constructed as being healthy. And unfortunately, what we then do as South Africans, we're putting on these masks with smiles on our faces, but we're carrying around pain that we don't understand. And for me, I feel that a lot more criticality needs to be given to the manner in which mental health professionals are actually trained. Many students believe the issue actually rests at the university, but it's more at a macro level. Because we can train 100 students this year, but those students need to be placed at government institutions for training. So the mental health priority has to come from the top. It has to be prioritized. And we have to, go, we have to shift away from the narrative of just speaking mental health to actually doing it. And I can talk very passionately about this for hours, but <laughs> I want to maybe quickly move on to my second uh, question, if I can. Okay. If, I, if I could, I can just pose the question and we can go to the second respondent and maybe there'll be some time. Okay. But I would love to get this question. The up. second question, Please. Prof, and then Dr. Okay. Bajam Boys. All right, my apologies. I'm very excited, obviously, about gender and masculinity and, and, and femininity, right? And, and reading the book, I have to, I was, I was struck by the gendering of grief that there's no way we cannot gender grief the way we gender every other um, social construct and phenomenon and experience. And as a female, when, when, when Ricky passed on, I remember reading this in the book where you were immobilized on the floor and through prayer they picked you up. And the words that were told to you was, you have to be strong, you have to stand up. There are children wanting and needing your support. So my question to you, just to keep in mind is, how is gender shaped and constructed how and what you have been grieving. Do you want? Okay, you write it down. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, and first of all, I just want to thank our hosts, and I'm really excited to be here. And thank you for the invite. Um, and then to Mom Louisa, um, thank you so much for sharing your life with us in the book. I thoroughly enjoyed your writing. The person who told you that you write well was not lying. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. It felt like, like I said to you in the morning, that it felt like I was sitting with you and having a conversation. But at the same time, it felt like I was waiting for an adult to say, get out, the adults are talking. Um, because the way I grew up was not one where I could kind of sit with my mother and have those kinds of conversations that you share with us and that you desired to share with Ricky in the letters that you wanted to write. And so I really like how the book is almost an invitation for intergenerational conversation. And I was so inspired so much that after reading the book, I texted my mother and I was like, we need to talk. I don't know how, what form or shape it's going to take, but I want us to sit down and talk, maybe in an interview. But I want to hear about your love life. I want to hear about your marriage. I want to hear about your mothering. I want to hear it all. So thank you so much for that gift to me and my mother um, that we are hopefully going to enjoy and kind of reckon through it. I'm sure it's not going to be easy, but I'm really excited for that. Um, and I also was really excited in the book with how you were able to weave in the politics of the country um, as well as your own mothering um, and your parenting and your own childhood um, but at the same time, it was really sad, and I mean, you mentioned it again now when you were talking, how the issues you were dealing with back then are still the issues that we're talking about now. We're still trying to think about how to confront whiteness. We're still dealing with racism. We're still dealing with patriarchy. 
we're still dealing with GBV. Um, but I'm glad that this book tells us that there's still so much work that needs to be done. So I think there's something for everyone in this book. Um, everyone can pick up something. And I think I'm so glad that you, you said books when you were talking. And I was like, because I kept wondering, I wonder how many, I mean, it sounds like the story was so difficult to get out of you. But I wonder if you still have it in you to take out a few more of those stories. Because I really think different aspects of the book can, you know, grow a book and they can be a book on their own. So I'm really excited to see the other books that you are yet to birth. Um, and my first question um, is about stories exactly. Um, when we write or when we read books like this, I always wonder how, how do we honor and stay true to our own story, um, but also think about how our life is shared with so many people. It's shared with our, with our loved ones, our children, our husbands, our partners. Um, and how do I tell, how do you tell your story without telling stories that are not yours to tell? You know, how do you, because um, it's something that I was thinking about a lot that, I mean, I'm sure your, your children read the book, your partner read the book. And I just wondered how, how you navigated that, deciding what's yours to tell and what's not yours to tell, um, and reckoning with that with your family. Um, so that's the first, I want you to think, <laughs> whilst you think about that, I'm going to, to go into the second thing um, that really resonated with me in the book, and that was your mothering. Obviously, as a person who studies motherhood, but also as a mother myself, um, I really enjoyed in the book how, how you enjoyed your children, you know, how you loved your children when you talk about them feeding, um, when you, you know, you talk about how um, being with your baby felt like God's presence and love's presence. And the other thing I really liked, though, when you talk about motherhood in an age where, you know, even Beyonce says we're strong enough to bear the children and get back to business, um, you are like, no, you know, even though it might have looked like that. Because when we read about women like you who've done great things, who've, who've been involved in shaping the country, we believe that they're strong enough to bear their children and get back to business. Um, but your book says, no, that's not how it, it happened. Um, and it, it's not that easy. And so I think um, the book is sort of like a window um, into, into the lives of strong women like you and what happens behind closed doors. You know, we get to humanize them. We get to think about how they are more than just women who are involved in the writing of the Constitution, but they're also mothers. You know, they're also partners. Um, but also... You know, you tell us how you navigated um, being a working mother um, and what you, what you tell us, which I think is really important um, in the book, is that it's about community. Um, it's about your own mother um, being a strong part of that community. In fact, the language you use when you talk about your mother is we. A lot of the times you guys raised the children together. Um, but you also speak about your mother-in-law um, and how instrumental she was when you went back to, to, to varsity in Turf Loop. Um, but and what I want to ask then is about how you navigate that community. Because you talk about your own childhood. You say um, that I see young Louisa standing behind the perimeter fence at home watching the neighborhood children playing. And a big part of your childhood was characterized by this intense feeling of being trapped, being socialized into being, you know, a rule follower who's obedient. How then, when a person who was part of that childhood, um, your mother, when you're raising your children with them, how do you navigate that, okay, mama, this is how you did it with me. Did you guys ever get the time to have that conversation? That this is how you mothered me under these kinds of rules, but this is not my desire for my own children. What was your own relationship with rules and how you raised your own children? Um, and just um, how, how did your mother reproduce how she raised you? Did you guys have to sit down and have tough conversations about mothering and community? 
Um, and I think I want to let you answer some of those questions before I continue, because I can go all day. So, may I start with uh, Prof Ali's uh, question before I get to uh, Dr. Majombos's questions? There, there actually is um, a lot of gendered perspective to, to grief and to our own grieving. Because Ricardo's death was a loss of a son, a husband, a father. There was a, a brother. There was a very, very um, direct way in which um, us women stepped into that connection of grief. And it was us stepping in to mother, to sister, and, 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 and to hold a lot that needed to be held. I still sit today and look at Ricardo's wife. She's a tiny, tiny uh, person in, 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 in bodily structure. But I sit and look at how she opens herself up to hold everything. And I say, where is her space for herself? And recently, I am at least getting some comfort because she is talking about her finding her own space and way to go deeper into herself and to address herself. A year after Ricardo, she's been just holding everything together. So maybe we should just give tribute there. So that's an example of how the grieving process does take that color. It does become fundamentally engendered. And um, I am very, I'm very, very blessed and filled with gratitude that throughout the grief, I have walked with Kumi, really, really walked with Kumi right here and have been able in therapy to even have those conversations about how emasculating the whole experience of witnessing a shattered partner has been for him. And, and, and he has had to navigate that because that's another way in which we ascribe roles to grieving. And when the capacity is not there to, you know, just do what the male role is in the grief process, you are going to crumble. My sons, I mentioned that I relate, I, I raise children in the way that I was. So they have a lot of quiet. So my journey with my sons is that of trying to build these circles of care, comfort, and ability to open up on everything. We're starting, we're moving slowly. It's a, it's a deep, deep journey. And so that is a real thing that we have to go into, yeah. And that touches on the first question uh, Dr. Majombozi asks about 
stories that are ours to tell and those that are for others to tell. It is a, a huge, it is a huge concern. One thing though about the writing of this book was that for me it was not just telling the story, it was still part of the healing process. You know, e even as I was on this computer typing in the words, it was as if I am in another process of releasing. And so what needed to come out could not be held back. I needed to just let it go. And so your question about the thought process for it, it was mainly, I have to let it go. I have to release these things. And then it was in the review of it where I did apply the questions, was there unnecessary unkindness here? Is there an unnecessary damage that may be um, caused by perhaps the framing or the presenting at this time or in this way? So I did uh, allow um, the consideration, but I did not cause myself to hold back on what needed to be truly and fully released from me. In that way, I'm taking the opportunity to also offer my apologies where I hurt others. It would not have been intentional. It just would have been that process of healing. On the last question of mothering and how community or family um, played a role for me. It, it's interesting how I had heard this, the, this saying many, many times where people say, what happened to my mother? When the grandchildren came, I lost my mother. Where's my mother? Somebody else appears when it's grandmother role. So with my own children, um, my mother was absolute safe space, absolute open space. The rules were only necessary. In fact, sometimes they were quite absent. <laughs> so so it, it, it really was a, an easy flow. We did not have to have. Um, quite engaging conversations about how we raise children in order for them to be prepared for the world and, and so on and so on. But she's the one who reined, reined me in because at baby number three, she said to me, excuse me, Louisa, my life did not start at 40. I am 60 now and I am determined that it is going to start. So if you are going to have babies and babies, please don't, do not plan me in. And, and I said, fair enough. I said, fair enough. I want to say I laughed when I read that part in the book, but it was quite funny that, and then she joined you two months after you moved to Cape Town. <laughs> so she continued being an amazing gogo. Um, I don't know if I have time for one more question, Dr. Gabby, or if I should just let the audience have fun. Um. One more question and then we'll open it up to the audience and the online audience as well. Okay. My next question has to do with the politics, right? So, I mean, you talk about how at home you guys had to speak in English and proper, you know, etiquette on the table. And your father's way of confronting whiteness was familiarizing yourselves with the ways of white people so that you never feel inferior to them. Um, and then you also talk about how, you know, the fees must fall, uh, movements inspired you to talk about your stories with GBV and kind of open up with your secret pals. And I'm thinking around that same time, there were also calls to decolonize and different ways of confronting whiteness and reclaiming what it means to be umzulu or umkosa and, and celebrating it a little bit more. And you do talk in the book about how when you went to Etegui and LP, you, you started learning about Zulu culture and how you enjoyed that. Um, 
And then you also talk about your father being instrumental in the ch in the business chamber where, you know, it was about um, black excellence and, and encouraging black people. And I, I'm, I'm interested in these contradictions. So on the one hand, at home, we're confronting whiteness by doing the things of, of, of the white people, but then we're also encouraging black people. And then you're at school and you're learning about what it means to be umzulu. And I wonder how did... Did those things fold into your own mothering? How how did 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 you kind of do those politics of what it means to be umzulu? Is it something you shared with your children, uh, or that you wish to share with your children or your grandchildren? Um, and also, how did your father kind of those politics um, in the business area around Black Pride? How did those fold into the intimacy of your own home? In addition to the we are only allowed to speak English and we're going to sit on the dinner table and have proper table etiquette. How did those kinds of things um, work out, both in the personal and the political? How did those marry? I feel that question has answered itself, really. Because in posing it, you actually are allowing us to weave in all these facets of life that become us, they're part of us. You allow us to see these contradictions that really belong, they belong in us, all of them. And really, the, the, I think that answers the, the question. So for, for me, um, the reality that, <laughs> We are in this small four-roomed house space, and here there's English being spoken and, and, and uh, table manners and fork and knife uh, from the age of when, it, when you are able to sit at table. And yet I'm looking out and I'm wanting to, to play with Dumbezi there at next door. They, they got Dumbezi, they are having fun. It's, it's really, really fun. And you see Udumbez is carrying his plate outside. He's eating kamnandi, kabishine, and pap. You, you want that. And so I'm looking out, I'm yearning for that. It's still part of it, but I'm taking it in because. What then, I suppose, I, I, didn't, I don't conclude this or, or suggest that in the book, but I suppose... What really makes me open to wanting to understand and feeling part of um, my Zulu culture is this deprivation, because I'm now particularly interested. When we move to B section, okay, I, I, was, I was born in F section, Guamashu. I don't know if anybody has a relationship with Guamashu. Oh, ah, <laughs> <Jay Swam. laughs> so when we move from F section to B section in Guamashu, two houses from our home is Mposhongo's home. At Mposhongo's home, there are real concerts. On Saturdays, it's a real concert. So you better... Hey, you look forward to it. Yes. And so it's this exposure to, and still I'm, I'm in a confined space though at my home. So it's this exposure to the vibrancy that I feel from witnessing that, and I take it and it belongs, and yet I'm here in a confined space where the rules are you speak English, and that still also must belong. So I'm navigating all of that and I'm allowing myself to find joy in the more liberating way of being. So when at standard one, we're learning about how to build a heart. And I've got no clue what all these parts that are being talked about are. We're learning about types of grass in Isizulu and how we're weaving them through with the different types of uh, stronger material to build the frame of the house. And I'm captivated by all of this. And this becomes my own opening to part of my true self. And in raising my children, 
I raise them being very open to their grounding, who they are. Of course, I'm limited, you'll see in the book, that I'm limited in my family line because I cannot go beyond my father's generation. Of course, the misfortune of grandparents dying soon as well or dying early also played a part, but the silencing of my lineage in the story of my family means I don't go beyond my, 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 my father's um, generation. And that's a task for me and my, my children probably will, may be interested in digging more and finding out and going into that history. But these are the ways in which we do come alive when we allow ourselves to explore what are our cultural practices, what, what, what heals us, what brings us alive, what identifies us, not to the exclusion of everything else. Yes, and I also love the, 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 the comment you make about, for example, us adopting humor as a way of coping in the absence of tools for coping with the challenges that we are meeting. Because for me, humor is something important, but we don't stay there. We don't stay there. We don't allow everything to be colored different by humor. We must allow things to be as they are. And humor will find its way there and it will do its role. For example, when we were facing the house robbery, I'm now going to victimize my loved one. When we were facing the home invasion, it was traumatic, it really was. But on the same day, um, a friend comes through who is a journalist, and because the people who had invaded our home had found a suitcase, Kumi's suitcase, which had his clothes, they took everything else. They left that suitcase outside. They didn't want to take his clothes. So the friend finds this now and he says to everybody, I've been telling this guy for a long time to really attend to his dress sense. <laughs> Even the lumpen proliterate, proliterate will not take his clothes. So, so, so you can imagine we are suffering and all of this, and we're bursting out laughing with all the pain. Yeah. So, so there's place for humor, but we don't stay there. We, we allow everything else to take its place. Uh, thank you. Um. Okay. Um, we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, our physical online and online audience. Um, I'm going to take hands. I'll take maybe three at a go. One and three. And you can start over here. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Hi everyone, um, I'm Fihiwe from M. Tonjeni Student Wellness, so I'm an intern psychologist. Um, just a reflection on the listening and how I followed Umam Louisa on Instagram. And as someone that also was a big fan of Uriki, I hope I don't cry when I speak about this. Um, so I'm reflecting on the book itself. And I'm thinking how we've always listened to his interviews. And I think people that are friends know that he spoke about his yearning for his mom and his dad. And as a child as well, that has the same struggles, you, we tend to victimize ourselves and you don't see what, what are the inabilities or the, the things that the parents have went through that are disabling them from being able to show up as best as they can. And now I'm reflecting at the fact that his death gave you life. 
and how it allows you then to be a greater mother and grandmother to his children as well. And how much healing you will be able to do through the book for South Africa as a whole. And looking at how much he was so influential when he was alive and in his death, he's still being able to bring so much healing. So now I'm thinking as someone that also wants children and as a black woman that is trying to be as powerful as you are and how you would then be able to teach and empower us as people that want to be mothers as to how we go about the journey then. You don't have to answer it now, but it's something that you can look into in the books that you want to write. In how you will bring this book and use it, in how you empower them as well as mothers, how they can navigate parenting and navigate healing themselves as well. That, um, so this is just a comment to say thank you for that. And also thank you for not seeing yourself as a victim. Maybe on the 23rd of February 2022, you did wonder why you, but at the end of it, you became a victor in the sense that you created meaning out of this difficult um, situation. And for that, I'm saying thank you. And also to Prof Ali's comment, um, what I'm seeing is that in as much as South Africa has limited psychologists, but we have people like Umam Louisa that bring healing. So it's not necessarily that we need the psychologists. <laughs> we can also have the community in itself to help with the healing, which then also speaks to Ubuntu. So that's it from me. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Nam Bula. I am one of the service providers for off-campus uh, for Nelson Mandela University. Um, um, I need to say to greet everyone that is here, and I'm also grateful to be here. Um, and I'm also very grateful for your book. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Um, and I'm so sorry for your loss. And it's important that you know that it was a great loss for everyone, uh, especially as a mother, you know, trying to figure out how do you go on when you, have, you find yourself in a situation like that. Um, as a mother who has a daughter that tried taking a life as well last year, um, and um, as a mother that you tried your whole life over all the trauma that you've been through, to shield your children, feeling whatever you had felt as a child, but somehow your children got affected without you being away. Um, how do you then overcome the guilt um, of somehow projecting your pain without even you being away and thinking that you were doing everything accordingly? Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nitsaza Yilimpanza, and I'm a student research assistant at Kreshets, and I'm also an MA candidate. Um, first of all, thank you for the book. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I just read a few summaries online on it. And when you started speaking, you spoke about how um, the environment that you were raising your children in sometimes hindered um, you being there fully for them. And... Um, as a black woman, of course, of, because of the things that you went through. And it had me thinking that it's a historical recurrence because our grandmothers, when they were in slavery, they had to run their households in their slave chambers, and they also had to run the household in their master's chambers. So either way, nothing could have worked or nothing could have progressed if the black slave woman was not, was not um, present. This still occurs even now, 
with our mothers and now even with us and potentially even with the children that we are going to give birth to. Because in the midst of everything that happens to you as a black woman, um, you are still expected to be this mobile rehabilitation center for black women, for, for, for black men who claim to be uh, psychologically damaged by, the, by, by participating in the armed struggle. We're not denying that, but also you are a beacon of hope and a place of rest for your children, for your loved ones and for your family. But then when you get to a point whereby you want to liberate yourself and deal with what you're going through, there is a level of neglecting those that are holding on to you. And there's a trend. Most people who got married in their 20s or in, when they were 19, 20, 21, they get to the age of 40 and they go through divorce. And most of them, when they were asked what led to it, and they say, when I started thinking about myself, it started to crumble. So as a black woman who, as she said, who potentially wants to be a mother, and with all of the things that I go through and I will go through, how do I get myself in a space of healing, but also not let go of those who are looking at me as a beacon of hope because we're black and we believe in Ubuntu. And Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. So I don't want to let go of them because I don't see myself or I don't see my capabilities of being a mother as a, a bad thing. You know, I don't see the capabilities of being able to hold people as a bad thing. Men have taught us to do that, and it's really not a bad thing. So how do I go through that level of healing, but also don't, and not let go of them and not neglect them? Thank you. So I should answer the first three. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Fihiwe, uh, for those comments. And indeed, indeed, that is the call to recognize that in community, we actually have systems that we can support, which heal us, which give us health, which give us identity, which help us find our way as we get lost. And some of those systems are being so devastated by the brutality of life, and uh, that we, we are also just not seeing them. Um, the system that I leaned on, grandmother, those systems, we can even extend it beyond the family unit. The caring in community is a huge way of um, healing ourselves and healing our history. And I'm hoping that as we move towards launching the Ricky Rick Foundation for the promotion of artivism, we are going to be inspired by that which uh, is inspired by Ricky's call for all of us to care and love and do as much as we can in that vein. To as individuals, as organizations, where we are, be reinvigorated to care for our mental health, to care for our well-being. And I hope government, business, education systems, all systems will take the call as well. Thank you for the, those comments. And Nomvula, uh, you ask a very hard question, which I was hoping we would avoid here. But it's a real question. It's so real. Um, it's so real that without many words, I can tell you that before we started therapy, I had said to Kumi in a moment of him coming close to me when I was really, really, really sad and down, I said to him, I killed my son. And that was guilt speaking. That was responsibility speaking. It was not necessarily truth. But that's what you can expect, especially um, from a death by suicide. You can expect that. 
And we have to be able to walk the journey with those. I know that when I speak of therapy, I'm talking about something that is not necessarily readily accessible, available. But I'm not trying to limit it to the professionals such as the ones that we went to. I really do mean, let's find our spaces of care. Let's create the spaces of care. You spoke about umanyano. Manyano means a union. Let's have those engagements where we actually can bear ourselves completely naked before each other and trust that our hearts will be held with care and we will be soothed and we will start finding our way. Um, I hope I got your name right. It sounded like a beautiful name, Etisinete Zegile. Wow. Um, thank, you for, thank you so much for that, Sinete Zegile, because that's the, that's the root of everything. You know, we create things, sometimes without even knowing it, we create things based on the frameworks that we know, and most of our frameworks are just exclusionary. They are binary. It's this or that. And when we allow ourselves to break a little free from that, and we start looking at what is this picture of me being this and that and that and that and everything, what is that picture? We actually give ourselves permission to create those environments where we can be black professionals taking care of ourselves, allowing others to take care of us as well in the way that we need to, and yet taking care of those close to us. Some of you may have followed uh, Kumi's book tour last year around November, December, where he was talking about the book he wrote, Letters to My Mother. And yet, he so clearly puts across the mantra that had to be drilled into people in the liberation structure, I mean, in the liberation struggle, where allocating time to things that are joyful, things that are personal, felt like sacrilege felt like betraying a cause. So imagine now a whole generation that's coming to life with a framework like that. Shall we start dancing? Shall we start creating? Shall we start loosening up and seeing the value of loving and caring and being in peace and being in joy together? Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Sipogazi to read uh, our online comments, and then we're going to take a round of questions and comments from the audience as well. And I think, just as I, if I may, um, I think you're, you're highlighting how the story couldn't present itself until you did work with yourself and in yourself, through yourself, is really important because... I think now, particularly in the times of social media, um, a lot of us are expected to have things happen to us and we're supposed to package them very quickly and give them narration, conception, and even imagery and <laughs> visuals and sound to it and make it make sense almost immediately so that we can share it with the world. And that can be very damaging. It can be very damaging because we're telling a story that we ourselves have not accepted. We ourselves don't actually understand how it has impacted us, how it's going to continue to impact us. I mean, grief is, and grieving is one of those things that is a lifetime's work. And um, I think that it's something that we really need to consider because we exist in, on many platforms now. And I just wanted to highlight that, but Supervisor, can you please? Dr. Gabby, hi everyone. Okay, just a few comments here. Um, one from Vuyo Bongela. We have moved from African ways of therapy 
We are isolated in our townhouses where in the rural area I grew up in my aunt, my aunt, my uncle, my cousins were close. Thus, organic therapy took place. And another one from Annalyn Kiet. Louisa, by making yourself so vulnerable to us, the public, a window, into, a window into your life, you illustrate that vulnerability is powerful. Thank you for your book as a gift, a pathway that may steer many people in the direction of healing their pain. Another one from... Um, Hafsa Devangri, I love the statement, what happened to my parents? They stepped into grandparenting as brand new people, leaving me both humbled and irritated. I'm so glad that my mother and I have started writing letters to each other. Then one last one, it's a bit of a long one, from Amina Sali. Prof. Ellie, I concur with your sentiments about the shift in the core purpose of studying psychology. If our careers, especially in the humanities and psychology, are driven by economic gains, then we have lost the plot of professional beings. Affordability and access to these services are indeed becoming a problem as mental health affects how we handle stress and make correct life choices. What are we doing as a country to address mental health because we at Mandela are preparing our graduates with theory and some practice? But this is not sufficient because with mental health, there are issues of stigma, social disadvantages, and isolation as well as loneliness. How do we connect the dots in a country that is so fragmented and youth, with, and youth in particular, feeling vulnerable because of unemployment, social ills, etc.? Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask the uh, psychologists on the panel uh, this question. Uh, it's an advocacy question about what is to be done, right? So even before Ricardo's passing, Luisa and I had arrived at a point that we needed to better understand um, indigenous healing systems from around the world. Right? Whether it is Iboga from Gabon, some of you might know, from Central Africa, or whether it's Ayahuasca from uh, the Amazon, or, but basically saying that before colonialism, we had plant medicines that indigenous people used for the healing. So Louisa and I, we make a confession, technically illegal, uh, <laughs> but that's not new. <laughs> I've been doing illegal things since I was 15 when I became an activist. <laughs> so, no, no, but, but the point is that accessibility of things that have healed before, when there's an absence of alternatives, my question is, has the time not come for us to stand together and say to the Medical Sciences Council, you'll need to wake up, smell the coffee, recognize we're in a crisis, and really start serious conversations around that. So that's my first question. But, but, okay. but I want to just say specifically uh, that um, plant medicine is an easier thing because we can argue it very much that colonialism tried to wipe it out and it has a right to prosper again. But where it gets more difficult is with certain, certain things that go beyond plant medicine into psychedelic science. And I want to just, you will read it in the book, but uh, I'm not sure Louise and I would be here were it not for a therapy that helps uh, recover Louisa's memory from 24 and a half years ago. So just to put it in a nutshell, we were separated in that armed robbery for two hours, which I described as the two longest hours of my life. Louisa had no recollection of what had happened to her. It was only when we went into therapy three and a half hours, three and a half months into the therapy that this wonderful therapist said to us, folks, I think you're ready to go back and revisit the big trauma of what happened that night. And the therapy that was used was pharmaceutical grade MDMA, right? And right now, again, by the way, that's also illegal, right? Uh, uh, so, so, so yeah, 
Good for you. Uh, so right now, so right now, the, the FDA, and you know how our policy makers are very, they can go on about white monetary capital and so on, but at the end of the day, they do everything what the Americans say in terms of things, right? So now the FDA is doing a mass trial with veterans in the U.S. as I speak, mass trial with MDA, MDMA to treat PTSD, right? So I'm using this, I hope I haven't abused it. I believe we need a robust conversation in this country to make accessible all these therapies and not for very narrowly trained psychologists and medical professionals to determine this for us. Do you agree with that? <laughs> I think that everyone agreeing is an indication of a shift in the narrative, right? Eh? Um, but I just want to comment on, on, on what you stated about the, the need for us to deconstruct and maybe not deconstruct, but go back to IKS and indigenous knowledge systems. I'm going to reflect on one of the many studies that my students have done. And, and one of my students looked at post-traumatic stress, PTSD. Individuals who've experienced PTSD, it's diagnosed by a psychologist. You've been for therapy but it just has not helped you. Okay? And, and we were interested in the culturally informed coping strategies. And this student is Ghanaian, so she looked at a Ghanaian sample and a South African sample. So it wasn't just a South African-based sample, we looked at two contexts. And with every participant that we had in the study who went for psychotherapy, concluded the psychotherapy for at least six months, and then we interviewed them and asked, well, what helped you heal? Guess what? It was the burning of Mpepo, it was the salts, it was the prayer, it was the fasting, it was the rituals that they, that they embodied post their healing that actually got them to the point of actual healing. So the point is, psychology in the country at the moment is fighting a losing battle because what we're doing is we're attempting to provide mental health services, but we're fighting against the current because what we're doing is we're trying to further entrench a particular westernized view of how to heal without fully engaging with the needs of the country, of people which go beyond the biopsychosocial. It is spiritually included. And spiritual experiences are psychological in nature, yet we still ignore them in our dominant psychological discourses. When it comes to IKS, I feel that the demonization of in indigenous knowledge systems is exactly what you spoke about, the white capital monopoly. Because if we go and treat people with Mpepo and the burning of all these herbs and spices that do have, you know, healing capacity, then what happens to the pharmaceutical companies and these doctors who charge us copious amounts of money to tell us, I think you're depressed. <laughs> okay, and, and this is the problem with the label of depression is that the greatest atrocity in Africa has been the introduction of English as a language. Because depression, psychology, schizophrenia as terms do not exist in African languages. And if they don't exist in a language, how does the disorder exist? So what are you then treating as a psychologist? You're missing the point. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, sitting here as an anthropologist, I'm just like, we've been saying, <laughs> you know? So I'm glad that psychologists are coming to the party. Um, and I really think that, um, you know, there's room for psychologists. And I think to go outside and play with other disciplines, you know? Anthropologists have been saying this, sociologists have been saying this, people in women and gender studies have been saying this, historians have been saying this. <laughs> So I just, I think when we think about healing and spirituality, let's just go out there and explore what everybody else has been saying as well. Not, and as well as, of course, the people that are affected themselves. But Mum Louisa also wanted to say something. No, no, I, I wanted you to say something. And, and that, that's, ex I agree with both of you. Let us all play. And, and there's a term I like, I'm not sure which professional uses it, but it's about bringing all these dis disciplines and finding consilience amongst them. Um, to the students who are studying, um, you, you're still doing your degrees. I, I challenge you here now, and, and this is a great challenge. It's not to critique your lecturers, but to critique the theory. That when you are in the classroom, engage with the theory from a personal level and ask yourself, I'm learning about Sigmund Freud or Marxism or whatever it is. How does this actually apply? 
to my people and to myself? Can I see this actually working? And if so, in which way does it actually best fit? Because that theory is Western. And the only way you are actually going to make it relevant is by critiquing it from within. So that's a challenge I have for everyone, is look at the theoretical positions and epistemolo epistemologies you are given critically. Instead of just studying it and, and passing the exam with a 90%, ask yourself, what does this theory actually mean if I apply it to my lived reality? And that's when you'll find a shift in the narratives that we unfold. Okay. Thank you. Um, may I ask you to give us your closing statements? Um, and then we will end the discussion. Thank you. Should we start with Dr. Majumbozi, Prof. Ali, and then Mam Louise? <laughs> I think um, my closing is to first of all thank you again um, for the story and to say may we all be inspired to do the work um, that needs to be done in us to birth the stories um, that we have inside of us and we might not all have access to therapy in the way that Mam Zondo um, had access to but this conversation has showed us that we all have spaces where we can go to get midwives who will help us in our lives birth the stories that we need to birth. I'm just going to say that I, I guess the, the basic premise of everything we've been discussing about is to turn the mirror onto yourself um, and to actually reflect very deeply on what colonialism, your theories, education, um, our uprising, our upbringings, um, our experiences have actually done to us and how has that actually been a violence against the self and the moment you start engaging with that you would actually start unpacking who you truly are. I think it was a question about the divorce at 40. Yeah. I'm close to 40 and I'm now seeing the existential <laughs> crisis that you talk about. It's no lie because suddenly at this age you start seeing things from a bird's eye view and you're like what is going on here? This doesn't make sense. So my, my, my point to you in closure is be brave, be courageous, and be kind as you engage with your pain, as you engage with telling your stories. Thank you. Uh, I just want to express gratitude, um, real gratitude for this opportunity to, to have this engagement and to say it is really my wish that we have a country, um, we create a country that is filled with exchanges and engagements of this nature. Uh, because the opening of the opportunity is very important. But then the navigation, the way in which we then move forward with it, is where we get the change that we would like to see. So um, as we move on, you will soon, soon be get, hearing news of the Ricky Rick Foundation as we move on to allow ourselves to be inspired by the uh, creation of a space where, which is actually inspired by Ricardo's life. I am really hoping that we will be able to connect we will be able to share your experiences, your good work in, in, in various places, and we will be able to support each other to make it a better place, to make life more meaningful, and to stop sitting back and not participating in the change that we would like to see. May we all stay shining. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you very much to our respondents as well to, as to you, Mam Zondo, for a very. I don't even know where to begin. I don't. This conversation went to so many places. Um, I'd like to ask Professor Makotwana to please give us our closings. Professor Makotwana is from the Center for Women and Gender Studies. Thank you.
colleagues, friends, and those who are watching online, thank you so much. Thank you so much to you, Mom Louise, for bringing us together today. Um, this is happening at a, at a very sad moment in our university when we have lost a young life, you know. So thank you for bringing healing to us as the community as well as we are grappling with what this means for all of us. Thank you, Professor Kiet, for connecting us to Umam Louisa Zondo and making sure that we share the intergenerational knowledges and the ways of coping through this book. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ali, for always making yourself available for our students, for the university, and also for the practice itself. Thank you, Dr. Majumbos, for saying yes and not even shaking when you were saying yes to come to Mandela and leaving your toddlers at home because of this important event. Thank you so much. The people that are watching online, I am aware that our Vice Chancellor, Professor Mutwa is also watching. Thank you, Prof Mutwa, and the audience that is watching online for helping us create platforms of this nature. Our students at Mandela, it is you, our staff members, who consistently show interest and in wanting to change behavior so that we can change the world for the good. Thank you for that. But Mazondo, when you said that the communities of care are necessary for us to start having those intergenerational conversations of trauma, I felt you. I saw it, Kukumi. I saw your community and I appreciated the camaraderie and the love and the, and the passion between the two of you in that partnership. I guess for all of us as young people, we need to learn of such values as well. When you talked about the communities of care that we know about in our own communities, Omamo Manyano, and we have taken the communities to be digital. We still owe to ourselves to have Ubuntu as a way of coping. We still owe ourselves to be compassionate as the book is instructing us. But I take what Prof Ali says around the issue of how we trained our students within our disciplines to prepare them for the real socio-economic conditions that are facing this continent and this country. Colleagues, whether they are online or you're here or not, we need to take the academic project seriously because it is what is changing the behavior and the consciousness of our students and definitely our society. This is why, Mam Louise, at Mandela, we have declared revitalization of humanities as a central tenant of our academic project. We are saying that we cannot do research, we cannot teach, and we cannot do community engagement without centering humanity's interest in the lab, in, the, uh, in studying plants, and also in doing physics. We need to be able to be conscious what does it benefit the humanity uh, in whatever discipline that you are doing? So thank you so much for reminding us of that. And I do hope that, as you beautifully said, that when we are living here, you leave feeling reinvigorated, revitalized, to be good to yourself, to be good to the one next to you, but also to embody one of our Mandela values, Ubuntu. Thank you so much, Spokas. May you bring the gifts. If, if there's anything else that Mandela is known for, one of the most beautiful universities we have in this country, is gifts. <laughs> we are known for gifts. Snobun to University. 
please accept our gifts. Maybe Uprof Kit can come for the picture when you're accepting the, the gifts as well. Maybe we can take one picture so that we can go and change the world together. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you.